So I was asked to come along this evening um, and just give a, a quick overview of the, um, the grand improvement project that we've been working on with, um, with EQC over the past uh, 18 months. Um, I've also been coming along to the Land Hub uh, this week and last week just to try and answer some of the, some of the queries from various people. Um, so if you have any questions after this, feel free to, feel free to come and see me or, or Rob next door who who will be around for a little while. Um, the talks really split into two sections. Um, both come under the title of Grand Improvement Programme. The first, the first, step, first stage was the, the Grand Improvement Trials. This is where we did all the blasting in the red zone um, during 2013, where we were bas basically testing a range of different Grand Improvement solutions to see if they actually work, see if they do what they're intended to do to improve the performance of the ground. Um, and then the second stage, which is the bit I've primarily been involved in, is the ground improvement pilot, which is basically taking those ground improvement solutions that were tested and seeing if we can physically, realistically build them on, on, your, on your sites, on residential um, sites in Christchurch and we can do it um, in a reasonably cost effective and, and you know without too much disruption to the owners and the, and the neighbours. Um, that second part as the slide says is, is sort of split into the rebuild pilot and the re repair pilot and by the rebuild pilot we're talking about sites where the houses are, are having to be removed, demolished so you're starting from fresh so we can do the ground improvement from a cleared site and the repair pilot is a grand improvement option for where the, the house needs to be repaired, but it doesn't need to be taken away. So we're looking at grand improvement beneath an existing dwelling. So we'll start with the science trials. Um, I guess before, I, before we get into the, the details of those, just as a bit of context for you, um, I'll try not to get too scientific or too technical, but effectively what you're doing um, from a concept point of view with ground improvement is we're not trying to prevent liquefaction through the full depth of the soil column. Um, liquefaction can occur from the ground surface right down to 10, 15, 20 metres or even more in some cases. Um, the trials that were previously done, which some of you may remember from the QE2 um, testing in, in sort of mid-2011, mid they were looking at primarily doing quite deep treatment, so treating the soils to quite a, quite a depth um, to try and reduce the liquefaction down to you know, 5, 10 plus metres. Um, and those, those ground improvement solutions were adopted by DBH or MBIE as it is now. But what we've noticed since that guidance came out is that there hasn't been much uptake of those ground improvement solutions. People have tended to, or the insurers and the, the PMOs have tended to go more towards the, the TC3 foundations, so the more expensive foundations, but um, tending to work out cheaper than ground improvement plus a TC2 foundation. So I guess, and the reason I mention that is probably one of the main drivers for all of this work that we've done over the last 18 months has been to try and find more economic, um, simpler solutions for doing the ground improvement. And the main way that we've been able to achieve that is to reduce the depth of the ground improvement. So what we're trying to achieve with, the, with these um, shallow ground improvement systems is basically create a, a really strong crust of material, of soil, immediately beneath your foundations that won't liquefy. Um, if the ground, the ground will still liquefy beneath those treatment areas, but because you've got a strong crust, um, your house and the land will perform much better than it has previously. And there's, there's considerable savings in, in that kind of a, approach. So <clears throat> we did the trials out in the red zone during 2011. There were several sites that were, that were tested. Um, TNT were sort of involved quite heavily but there are also um, experts from around the world, particularly the US, um, guys from the University of Texas came over and helped out. 
so initially we looked at four different types of ground improvement. Uh, I apologise for the acronyms. It's a death by acronym tonight. Um, the RIC, going along there, the Rapid Impact Compaction. RAP is Rammed Aggregate Peers. HSM is Horizontal Saw Mixing. And then LMG. And you'll, you'll see what these are as I go through the presentation, so don't try and remember those. Um, and then as we went through the trials, a few extra methods were, were added particularly timber poles and saw cement mixing. Um, there were a few others as well, which we won't go into because they weren't particularly successful and they were, they were done on a fairly minor scale. So after we put those different ground improvement solutions in the ground, we then had this machine called the T-Rex on the, on the left-hand side there, which came over from the University of Texas. And you can see the big yellow plate at the bottom. That's basically just shakes the ground um, to create liquefaction, to cause it to liquefy, or to try and liquefy it. Um, and then subsequently to that, we did the similar to what was done at QET, put lots of explosives in the ground, exploded them all um, in a short space of time, and created a shock wave that simulated an earthquake to, to cause liquefaction of the ground. And we certainly did cause liquefaction of the ground. I'm sure you may have seen from the pictures with sand boils um, ejecting after, after those tests. So we've identified a number of the ground improvement solutions from those that were tested that were, that were successful and there were a few that weren't so successful which have sort of obviously been ruled out and then <coughs> the results of the testing have been written up in a report and, and all, the, all the data, the report has been um, peer-reviewed by um, really world-renowned world um, specialists, experts in liquefaction and ground improvement techniques. These are primarily guys from the States because uh, they, they're just very, very experienced with this stuff following the, the earthquakes they had there in the 80s. Um, and then Misko Kubinovsky um, from the University of Canterbury as well. And then one sort of side thing that came out of the trials um, because one of the methods didn't work so well, one of the contractors came up with a, a, an alternative solution which is called HSM, um, Horizontal Saw Mixed Beams, and that was the solution I'm going to talk about for repairing existing properties. That wasn't intended that we were going to test that, it was a completely new idea as we went through the process. And the idea is that these new solutions that have been tested in the field, and as I go on and explain, been tested in, in, on real sites, will now be uh, incorporated into a revised document, guidance document, to be issued by MBIE. So many of you have seen the existing one, there's a copy out in the, in the hall, uh, which gives a range of solutions for different sites. But well, these are new and hopefully cheaper, more cost-effective solutions. So, that's a very quick summary of uh, the work that was done in the field in terms of the ground improvement trials. It went on for a year and lots of science and hundreds of people involved. Um, so, I'm going to keep this relatively succinct and I'll take some questions at the end. But the result of that is we identified five ground improvement methods that we thought were worth further investigating. We saw that they worked, feasible, they were technically feasible. And the, the big question was, can you actually build these on real sites across Christchurch for a realistic cost um, and without causing too much disruption and damage to neighbouring properties? Um, so that were the main objectives. Um, and this, this work, again, we've, we've now remediated, as part of the pilot project, 28 cleared sites, to sites where the has been demolished. And we've also just finished the third of three sites where we're putting these HSM columns beneath existing properties. Um, and that's been carried out since, since late 2013, pretty much as the field trials are finished. And we're just sort of finishing them now, just finalising the reports and things for, for those slides. Um, <coughs> So we selected those 28 or 30, 31 sites by looking ac right across Christchurch um, to, to select a range of different soil types. So we weren't just focusing on one soil type. 
uh, mix of properties in terms of the size of the properties, whether they're back sections, front sections, um, with limited access. So we, we've, we've got a fairly um, comprehensive range of the typical types of uh, dwellings in Christchurch. Um, those customers um, were people like yourselves who were approached by the insurers uh, on our behalf or on EQC's behalf, mm. and we explained uh, what we were doing, what we were trying to achieve, and they were, they were very keen to be involved. Um, and we've conducted these uh, 31 sites uh, spread across about 10 or 11 different tenders. So there's been a number of contractors involved, a number of different projects. Uh, so we spread them around. So what we're trying to do is stimulate the market to show the, show the contractors that these methods are um, viable and that they can be adopted. And we're hoping to encourage the sort of local contractors, the small, smaller contractors, not just the, not just the big guys that uh, there is a market for them to, to upskill and buy in the, the, the plant and equipment that they need to, to start servicing what will hopefully be a, a, you know, a strong demand and ground improvement. So just quickly give you an overview of what the different ground improvement solutions were, um, which are all explained on the boards out in the hall, um, and there's videos of them on the, on the iPads out there. So feel free to, to look at those if you haven't already. But uh, the first one was, um, it's referred to as round aggregate piers in the earlier slide. Um, round aggregate piers are a type of stone collar. Effectively, they, they do the same thing. All we're, all we're doing here is installing uh, columns that are typically up to a meter in diameter into the ground at fairly regular centers, maybe two meters apart. On average, maybe a bit closer, depending on, on your ground condition. Uh, and they're installed using what's called a, a vibro probe. And then all that is is basically a big steel tube, hollow tube, which is vibrated into the ground, displaces the soil, so you have a void in the ground, and then gravels fed in through the, through the hopper at the top and goes down the tube, and then the tube's gradually withdrawn and compacts the gravel. And what this does is, is effectively reinforce, reinforce the whole ground. So it's reduced, it's increasing the overall stiffness of the ground and basically just holding it all together so that when, uh, when the ground shakes, you're not getting such uh, big deflections. Can I ask a question here? Yep. Are there any consequences really when you have a high water table? Do you get uh, water drainage in reverse? coming up through your, your stone reinforcement? <coughs> no, no, there's um, it's been tested. There are some, there are various things about the ground water table which are really important for ground improvement. Yep. I can probably mention those as I go through the slides actually, because that's one of the limitations around which ground improvement solutions are applicable on different sites. Right. It's all to do with the ground water level, particularly with the, the Methods that require excavations. It's very difficult to create an excavation below the groundwater table. <coughs> Considerable expense of controlling that. Uh, but no, there's the, the water in the ground, uh, at the shallow ground surface. So these, sorry, I didn't say, these stone columns are typically going into about four meters deep. So they're not going a long way down. Uh, if they were to go down to the confined aquifer, where you've got high water pressures, then they would. Um, potentially provide a, a path to the surface, but because uh, they're so shallow, we're just going into the, the normal water table. Uh, there's, there's no pressure from those coming out. And what we do provide is a cap on top of the stone columns. So if there is some liquefaction from below the stone columns, the water will come up and it won't burst down uh, like a fountain in uh, those columns. The idea of the columns also, try not to be too technical, but Try not to get drawn into it. But part of, part of the purpose of the columns is also to, if the ground does start to liquefy, the high pressure of water, which is causing the liquefaction, it goes, immediately goes into the stone columns and that immediately releases the pressure, and therefore you don't get the liquefaction. Uh, there's just a couple of photos just showing a couple of the sites that have been remediated as part of this. 
obviously during, during installation, and then this is a sort of the result at the end. So it's one of those things, ground improvement that you spend an awful, well, not an awful lot, but a lot of money putting the ground improvement in the ground, and then hopefully you, you, know, you don't even notice that <coughs> after it's gone in. The second solution is driven timber poles, and these work on a reasonably similar um, basis to the stone columns. They're again they're about the same length, 3.6 3 meters long. They go push down to about 4 meters below the ground level, so similar to the stone columns. And again, the idea of these is that they're just reinforcing the ground, so it's moving as a, as a big block, effectively, um, stiffening the ground up. The, the timber piles you can see from the photo are typically about 250 millimeters in diameter, um, and they're just driven in um, on this particular site, or this particular contractor, he has a, a vibrating plate on the top, so he's just vibrating them in. Uh, it doesn't cause too much vibrations or noise for, for the neighbors. Unlike some subcontractors who have historically used a big one ton or two ton hammer and dropped it over a meter or two, and everybody for half a mile knows what's going on. So, this is a much better solution um, for installing these, these piles. Uh, yeah, and then because they're a smaller diameter, they're going in at a closer spacing, so this is typically about a meter to 1.2 meters apart. That would be much more cost effective solution. They're uh, reasonably similar um, to the stone columns and some of the other solutions. Depends on your site conditions, how, uh, how quickly you can install the, the piles. If you've got a really soft site uh, where you can push the piles in really quickly, then they're, they're quite cost effective. Uh, if you've got a site where you have to pre drill the holes a little bit, uh, then they can, they can be a bit more, a bit more expensive. Uh, so yeah, again, just some photos. Fortunately, these words were done during the, uh, the live train that we had in the, uh, earlier in the year. So uh, I mean, all, all the ground improvement solutions cause quite a bit of a mess while they're actually doing the work. That's, that's pretty much unavoidable. Um, you can see this, this turned into quite a boggy mess. Uh, but it's fixed up, as you can see in the top left picture. Let's see, dry down a little bit. Just with those poles being so close, how does that affect the drainage of the central, the natural flow? The natural drainage? Yeah. Uh, well, having the piles in the ground will obviously reduce the, 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 the volume of the, the, the ground in hold. And it's, in terms of the, um, the, the capacity, it's, it's having a very minimal effect. So it's, it's not something that you would, you would even really notice. Worth the, worth the pain of that. You know, we're not that expecting it to cause um, high ground water levels. Uh, it may slightly reduce, almost imperceptibly reduce the, the time it takes for surface water to drain. But again, there's a very, very low effect. Comes in low effect. Physically, it has to have something like that. Um, and then, <coughs> third solution is what we call source event mixing. This is pretty much, as it says, we're, we're taking the soil and we're mixing into it cement. And the idea is that the cement uh, combines with the soil and turns it into effectively a, a very weak concrete. So the soil becomes very stiff. Uh, Roni typically treat these to a metre, sort of 1.2, 1.5 metres below ground level. Uh, because, the, because the soil becomes so much stiffer, the, the thickness of the raft that you need to create that um, same performance of the land during an earthquake. You don't need a thicker uh, layer. So there's, there's two, two methods by which we do this. There's what we call in situ mixing, which is what's what shown here. So basically this, uh, this boom on the end of the, the excavator has a, a mixing head on it. So this boom will go into the ground, the head will mix the soil, turn it into a slurry, almost liquefy it, and then cement, uh, either as dry powder or as a or as cement mixed with water, will then be fed into the ground, and it's mixed up, rather like you would mix a cake mix, and uh, disseminate the cement powder right through the soil, and it will gradually go off and become a very hard, and you have a very hard stiff layer. 
typically what we've done on these sites is because you don't want a concrete um, or a solid cement stabilized material right across your garden areas, um, we've then got back about half a meter of just natural soil back on top. So you've got uh, you know, the amenity of your garden, you can plant plants and uh, trees and what have you. And that also protects the, the soil cement as well a little bit from uh, tree roots and things going into the the other solution is an ex-situ method where we dig out the soil, mix it through a, a, a separate mixer on the side, put a pipe down, we put the soil in and then the cement gets added there, and then we put it back on the ground and compact it, much as you would do with a normal fill. Uh, there's some positives and bonuses about each system. Uh, the ex-situ tends to be easier in terms of control and you don't need so much cement because you're compacting it but as soon as you have a high a site with high ground water table it becomes un unfeasible really it's just too much time and expense controlling the ground water it's just a couple more photos of, of the sites we've got there so it's, uh, it's a fairly, fairly big equipment this equipment's generally used for commercial applications in the past. So you know, one of the purposes of this improvement project was to find out you know, if we can realistically do these on, on residential sites, sites and also to encourage contractors to, to look at smaller gear. Which uh, so the question was, so I'm trying to the the house, yeah. how far? So how far do we need to do the ground improvement beyond the building footprint? Um, for this particular method, it's fairly similar for all the methods really. We typically say you should go a minimum of one metre beyond the house footprint. Because uh, as soon as you get beyond the ground improvement, that's where the liquefaction can come up around the outside of the, the ground improvement. So we want to force any liquefaction that does come up away from the, away from the building. Um, a minimum is ideally would be a meter. If you don't have space for that, then what we ask the, the structural engineers to do is to allow to design the foundations to, to span over the area that's not been treated. Um, so the foundations can cantilever over that area. So if there's a bit of sediment, uh, and that's quite easily done for a small distance. Uh, obviously, you can't do that underneath the whole property. Um, is that with perfection and escapes could it come from under the house for coming up from the sides of the Yep. Yes. Yep. So it could still take place under the house. Yep. So, so it's under the house is a problem. Yes. <laughs> it was somewhere else in the garden. Yeah. That's right. And that's a program through as well. You know, the, the, the bigger the area that's treated, the, the better. You know, the, the larger the area, the, the more it will prevent the infection from coming to the surface. Um, so it depends what, how you want your um, site to perform in the future, you know, whether you decide just to treat beneath the house, uh, beneath the house footprint, or whether you, you, know, you want to protect other areas, maybe a garage or outbuildings or um, just a garden area. So you know, it's, it's a decision whether you should carry on and do the rest of the, uh, your site. Uh, it's obviously going to be a, a, a balance of cost. Um, and benefit for each property. <coughs> yeah, if you plan on um, planting uh, trees, then if you've gone for this solution, you need to try and keep the, the, the ground improvement away from where you're going to plant trees. Or alternatively, look to uh, trees that don't have deep root systems. Um, there's no getting away from the fact that. Uh, the two don't mix brilliantly. Um, tree roots will try and get into the, the soil cement. It's not so hard that they won't be able to penetrate into it. But once they do that, then they'll start to weaken, weaken uh, how effective it is. So there's a bit of balance on that. But generally, people don't have house, I don't have tree roots, we're going to meet what's in the houses. It's, it's not too much of an issue. Uh, okay, excuse me, just like you done. We put that ground remediation into a meter out um, around the house, and there was uh, 
infection would otherwise occur in, in the next hundred year quake. Um, would that uh, if the infection is even forced outside of that pad, would that cause the house to drop? Yeah, potentially. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> so the idea of all of these ground improvement solutions is if you get a, a major earthquake where you get liquefaction occurring at, at depth um, and potentially get some ejector coming out beyond the beyond the building footprint, um, you you're still going to expect to get some settlement. Uh, the idea of the combination of the ground improvement with the, the uh, foundation design in the outer top, which would probably be a TC2 foundation if you did the ground improvement, is that the whole the whole ground will go down relatively uniformly, and it will go down a similar amount to the rest of the ground around it, um, or slightly less. So it's, as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's the differential movement that causes the, the damage to the houses and the foundations. So what we're, what we're achieving with uh, the ground improvement is we're not stopping it from settling a little bit, but it will settle less, and the, the differential settlement will be much less. That's, the, that's probably the primary aim of ground improvement and foundation combination is to reduce the, the differential settlement. But that actually didn't occur in relation to the California earthquakes, where in fact, you know, it will find its easiest way out. It will go that way, and then it will yeah. tilt. Yeah. And a lot of their property is tilted. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, gentlemen, that's a very good point. The, the settlement may not occur perfectly uniformly across the whole site. Uh, so more settlement may occur at one end of the building. But again, with the, with the foundation solution that you've got, and then the ground improvement, you've got a you've got a very good connection detail between the two to be able to then re-level the house from one side or the other side or, or you know, at several points. Because half the half the problem with re-leveling is that the existing foundations aren't strong enough that you can just re-level the whole house, uh, or the ground beneath it isn't strong enough to, to to jack off. So what we're doing with this combination is you've got a solid base to jack off. Uh, and then also the foundation itself is strong enough that you can you, know, you can re-level it from a few points rather than trying to try to re-level it from numerous points. Um, so it's as I say, you're creating a crust that's preventing the building from being badly damaged due to differential, but you'll never prevent it unless you treat down to the 10 or 20 meters, you're never going to completely remove some potential for settlement. But unfortunately, trying to do that is just uneconomic in the vast majority of cases. Uh, the, the final solution for the cleared sites uh, where we're moving is, is actually no real different to the existing um, option that's, that's been included in the, um, the MB, current MBI guidance. And that's a, a two meter deep gravel raft with. Uh, with the geogrid layers down, down towards the bottom. So the, the field trials tried to see if the, the gravel raft could, could be made thinner to make it more applicable to sites with a high gravel stable. Um, so we weren't having to do this sort of thing, but they from deep sheet piles, two meter deep excavations, and lots of ground to control. But the results from the field trial showed that you do actually need that two meter depth of gravel. So effectively, that solution is very similar to as it was in the existing guidance, but it just confirmed that the previous testing at QE2 um, you know, gave, gave the correct, correct result. Um, where this does become you know, a, a reasonable option is if you have lots of sites next, next to each other. So the particular uh, contract that we did here, we had 10 sites, 10 properties all next, next door to each other, which we could do all in one, all in one go. So the considerable savings should be able to do it on a, on a large scale. So it became you know, reasonably economic for that, for that site. But for individual one-off or even pairs of properties, um, you know, the gravel rafts are often going to be quite difficult. So if you're not shallow rails, again, just a few more photos. So the outcome of the pilot the findings from doing those 
28 sites is that the stone columns can be installed really quite quickly. It takes about three days to do an average residential site. Um, and they're pretty efficient. You don't need that much plant or that many people on site. The drip and timber piles are a little bit slower just because you only put so many of them in. Um, probably double the amount of stone columns because they're about closest closest space. But they're quite quick and easy to install. Um, the soil cement mixing was one of the best solutions that came out of the trials, gave really good results. Um, and there are so a couple of options for the in-situ or ex situ mixing. And we think we've stimulated the market quite well in terms of encouraging more contractors to come on board and start doing that work. Uh, and then the gravel raft, as, as per those pictures showed, um, very susceptible to uh, weather delays. Storm years mm -hmm. when excavations at the uh, maximum depth as it was in Clive Boy Forest. Uh, had a temporary lake there. So that's pretty much it from the, the rebuild site. Um, oh, just, just, a, just a few things, sorry, on the on feedback really from the customers. Um, but because of the delays with the rain and things that we had, you know, it's quite a, quite a difficult process. So on some of the sites, they're, they're expecting it to be done very quickly and a bit longer than, than we had hoped because of those delays. Um, but in the end, they were really pleased with the result. And, and all of them said that they would be, be involved again. Um, it was found quite challenging to, to connect all the different pieces of the puzzle, working with EQC and the insurers and the PMOs and their engineers our engineers, um, the council, the resource consent people. It's, uh, it's a real big team involved. So there's, there's processes in place to try and uh, streamline that as well. And then the typical site issues that we came across, again, were uh, getting these large plant onto, onto back sections in particular, with shared ownership of driveways. Um, one of the big issues we had was Asbestos being left on, on the site after the house has been demolished it causes us a lot of delays and, and headaches. We have to go back and clear, clear the asbestos again. Um, probably won't say too much about this, but <coughs> one of the, one of the um, outcomes that we wanted from this process was just again to try and streamline and make these solutions more cost effective. So we've come up with a, a set of standard specifications for the different ground improvement solutions. So all the contractors and the insurers, everybody knows basically what's expected for a, a particular improvement method. Uh, one of, some of the feedback we had from the contractors was when they had to read through our contract document and the specification of the several hundred pages and it cost them you know, cost of time and effort. So if they have a standard uh, document that they knew was going to be very consistent all the way. It, it really helps them speed up and the council and everybody else involved. So we've developed that and that's recently been um, issued to the sort of general uh, geotechnical community for um, sort of acceptance and comment and feedback. Um, <coughs> I won't go into presenting because I'm aware of the time. Um, re in terms of the repair side, so many of you have been in a position where you've got a house um, that needs repairs but it uh, doesn't need uh, complete replacement. Trying to improve the ground for those properties, um, obviously without having to remove the house to do the ground improvement was one of the, the really big challenges. So we didn't go into doing the ground improvement trials with any particular method in, in mind for that. It sort of came out of the failure of one of the systems we were trying. The contractor suggested that um, he had some equipment that he could potentially use to create something relatively similar. Uh, we won't go into too much technical detail here. Uh, relatively similar to the soil cement raft that we're talking about. But rather than installing them from the surface in an excavation, um, we're effectively pulling a directional drill 
beneath their house, just as uh, the council and other contractors use for installing services when they want to go under a road or whatever. Um, so they install, drill a hole underneath underneath your house from one end to the other, um, and then they add a, add a tool on the end, a mixing tool, and they drag the tool back, and as they drag it back, they mix cement into the soil, and that creates a stiff column beneath the ground, or a stiff beam beneath the ground. Um, and then they go back and do that on, on, a, on a number of sides, just flip to this next one. So you, what you end up with is a, is a whole series of um, saw cement mixed beams beneath your house. We do them in two, two rows at different heights. And effectively what that's doing is it's replicating the crust of non liquefied material. So you've got uh, maybe a metre and a half or two metres depth of, of soil that's not going to liquefy. So it's working in a very similar fashion to the to the other rafts, the source cement rafts, or the gravel raft. Um, how, how much would a solution like that cost? Uh, we're still working through that, but it's it's not cheap. Um, we're currently developing, or one of the contractors that we're working with is currently developing a new mixing tool which can go in both directions. It doesn't need to come out at one end and have the head attached at the far end and then pull back. It can just go in and retract the head and then pull it back. That's the sort of the trench at the far side that costs the, the time and the money. Um, so we're still working on those, uh, developing that, that solution. But the, the cost is still, still quite unknown at the moment. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of information in there. I don't want to go into too much detail, but you know, typically we're cutting two to three beams in a day, and your typical house will need around 25 to 30 beams. Um, so it takes about a month to do it. Um, with the, we've been trying, because we're really trying these still, the, the residents have actually moved out of those dwellings, but we're fairly confident that as the, as the contractors continue to get more experience, and the, the disruption from installing these beams will be will be such that people can continue to, to stay in the properties. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a danger that they get very slight damage to the foundations. Um, as, the, as the beam tree is stored, it tends to make the ground heave up a little bit, so you can get some sort of hair like cracks in the foundation, which then need to be fixed as part of this process. Um, again, we're, we're trying to refine the process, it's still in the development stage, where, where that uh, doesn't occur, doesn't occur as often. But yeah, so this is that's just a picture. This is one of the properties that, that, that we've reinstated. And as it, as it says over the, the, the last sentence at the moment, this is really the only method that we've got at the moment to conform, or at least one other method that we're in the process of evaluating as far as we're trialing. Um, but at the moment, this is the only solution we've got for it repairing or stabilising the ground beneath existing dwellings, which is why there's a lot of efforts going into uh, trying to reduce the, uh, the disruption and the costs. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we're trying to, uh, the, the idea is that all of these ground improvement solutions will be adopted under new guidelines so that um, you, can, you can use these ground improvement solutions in a TC free site. Um, to allow you to, to dump the, the TC2 foundation on the top. Um, that work is, is very much being controlled by um, TNT, the results from the field trials on the pilot, the peer reviewers who are reviewing that, and then also the advisors to MBI, the engineer and advisory group. Um, and then they're all sort of coming on board at the moment we're expecting that um, by the end of the year that new guidance will be will be released with some or all of these ground improvement solutions adopted as um, effectively as standard solutions. So you don't need to then employ um, an engineer to come and design something specific for your site. So cutting out the, the cost of that um, specific work. So would that mean therefore that the effective ways if you find an effective method? that when some land now becomes available, 
And no, set up. No, but all of these, I should probably should have said this up, all of these um, ground improvement solutions are basically aimed at improving sort of TC free land, or it could be used on TC2 land as well. Uh, the problems of the red the red zone land are way beyond what these ground improvement solutions will, will provide. <coughs> um, we have a paper on the and I have this flag I'm standing and I should put the ground this fun people. Those, these kind of solutions can still be used and the They can still be used, yeah. It's, um, so you'd be stabilizing the ground, uh, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to use uh, all of the TC2 family sharps because obviously they're not suitable to be, to be lifted out of the ground. Um, what you'd be providing with the ground improvement solutions is protecting your property from you know, the, the liquefaction damage, but you'd still need them to adopt a foundation option. Lift you up um, at a certain height. <coughs> uh, so, some of the existence of TC free foundation solutions um, can help with that sort of situation, yeah. but you wouldn't need the, you know, the, the gravel beneath those uh, surface slab options. It's provided that and stabilizing. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the IFE stuff is. Uh, but this is more for ILB, um, yeah. uh, but it will also increase the, the, the resilience of the, of the land in the areas as well. Yeah, but, 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 so, so, and sorry, and just an ancillary to that question I asked. On that basis, therefore, you're saying there is no solution for red zone land? Uh, there's certainly solutions, but um, not, just not being the best solutions. solutions. Not being the key. Yeah, that's not as bad. You can do it. Yeah. So it actually seem uh, near that with any chance that would be included in the new club lines was that further down the track? That's still being discussed to be honest. Um, they're trying to find a way of including it as a sort of <coughs> put it out there as a, as a possible solution but it will still need to be specifically designed for each site at the moment. That's, it's looking like if it does make it into the API guidance, it won't be a standard solution that you can just call up a contract and say, I need um, all of the HSM and you will need to still, um, it'll still need to be specifically designed by an engineer and signed off as an acceptable solution. So you can sort of face up in the future. Yeah, yeah. And that's just because all these ground proven solutions have sort of been very well tested now. Um, they have to construct them on all the sites uh, and demonstrate that they work. Whereas the, the HSM is, is further back in that process. Uh, yeah, we're, we're hopeful that with, with further work that it will get to that position. But it's, you know, it's, it's not there yet. And also, there's only really uh, very limited number of contractors who can actually do the work at the moment. So, putting that out as a solution that can be widely used would be uh, not really feasible. That used to be three meter lift, you say, over that fuel cost increase in terms of remunerating the land. The three meter lift. Lift lifting the house up three meters and the big one. Smart lift is what they call it. So it's literally putting the house three meters in the air so they can get out of the thing. Sorry, I wasn't familiar with that. Uh, 
dissent from, from resource consent. Uh, and that seems to be the way that we're going. So there's, there's been the amendments to the regional plans um, recently, and that allows uh, uh, much more of this type of work to go ahead without having to apply for resource consent. Uh, but we continue to, to develop that with the council. So let's say if um, Project City Council has agreed in principle that they will accept that. These solutions can be can be taken uh, with an exemption, uh, but the way we've done it for the ground improvement pilot project is, is to have a very strict control over how the contractors work on the site, a very detailed management plan. Uh, so it's a matter of really continuing with that process to make sure that, uh, the contractors are well aware of their obligations. Follow those strictly when they're, when they're doing these types of types of works. Uh, 